Okay, so in this video, we're going to look at what are known as joint probability density functions. And these are just very common uh, functions that you'll encounter in, again, a probability or statistics course. So before we talk about joint probability density functions, we're going to talk about what are known as bivariate random variables real fast. Okay, and to get us started, let's look at some examples. So it just turns out that lots of random experiments involve more than one random variable. That's not I think hard to believe so and I've given just three basic examples here so maybe an educator they're studying the joint behavior of your grades and the time you spent studying a physician may be interested in uh, studying blood pressure and a person's weight and an economist you know they may study the joint behavior of unemployment rates in a country and the relationship of the average household income. Okay, so these are just two situations that can be described by bivariate random variables. My situations are going to mostly deal with discrete random variables, but again, it will also apply to continuous random variables. Okay, so again, quick definition, what is a bivariate random variable? It's just an ordered, or excuse me, it's just a pair, x, y, excuse me, <laughs> bivariate random variable. It's gonna be an ordered pair uh, x, y of random variables. Okay, so let's get to what we're interested in here, joint probability density functions. And the idea is when we have these bivariate random variables, how do we go about producing these density functions? And we'll look at two examples. A little more terminology real quick. So what is a joint probability density function? So we've got this uh, ordered pair. So we're going to let x, y be a bivariate random variable. And r sub x and r sub y, those are going to be the range spaces of x and y. So, you know, sort of the events that can happen associated with each one of those random variables. A real valued function f, that's going to be a function that goes from the cross product of those range spaces into the real numbers. And that's called a joint probability density function for x and y, if and only if f of x, y, that equals the probability of x equaling x and y equaling y. So let's look at a couple examples here. The first one is one of these dice example. I don't know, maybe it feels a little contrived. Hopefully the second one um, will clear things up. All I'm going to do in these next two is just simply create these joint PDFs. So here's our, our example. We're going to roll a pair of unbiased dice. So we've got two fair six-sided die here. Let's, uh, let's even make two, right? So I've got two fair six-sided die. And x is going to denote the smaller of the two numbers that I observe. y is going to denote the larger. Or if they're tied, that's OK, too. We want to know what is the joint PDF. Well, let's think about the range spaces for our dice, right? So, well, the range space for our first die, what can happen? Well, we could get a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, a 5, or a 6. And since we're rolling another fair die, right, we could get a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So those are going to be the range spaces for each one of those discrete random variables. Now, you can imagine our sample space here. What could happen, right? Well, imagine, you know, the uh, I roll a 1 and then a 1. I could roll a 1 and then a 2. I could roll a 3 and then a 4. I could roll a 5 and then a 2, etc. So I've got all of the all of the events that could happen. So that's going to be our sample space. And in general, typically, we don't write out our sample space. We'll just try to count the um, the total number of possibilities. But, you know, for here, we can't actually uh, list that sample space. So suppose I want to compute f of 2, 3. First off, I need to make sense. Like, what, what, what am I even doing? Well, this says we saw, what did we see? We saw a smaller number of 2. We saw a smaller number of 2 and a larger number of three. That's what we saw. That's that's what we're trying to find the probability of. And again, it doesn't matter the order. It just says that's what we observed. Well, I think there's two ways to do that, right? I could roll a two and then a three, or I could have rolled a three and then a two. I still would report two is the smaller number and three is the larger number. So it looks like the probability of that event, well, there's 36 possible outcomes, right? Six times six, 
and two of those are favorable. What if it asked, you know, what's the probability, say, of, of, of recording a one and a one? Well, the only way that would happen is to get a one and a one, so that would be one out of 36. Let's look at one more kind of strange value. So what does it mean to, to, to so let's explain this one a little more. So suppose we want to know what is the value of f of 3, 1. Again, what does that say? Well, it says this. It says, this is the probability of rolling the two dice, right? You roll one, you roll the other. And it says three is going to be the, the smaller number, and one is going to be the larger number. Well, how does that happen? Well, it doesn't happen, right? That just simply can't happen. So the probability associated with that event is going to be equal to zero. Okay, and I can fill in the rest of these probabilities um, quickly enough. So notice if the, if the values were equal, like I had my 1-1 one, one example. It says if they're both equal, 1-1, one, one, you roll a 2-2, 3-3, 4-4, 5-5, 6-6. It says that would be the associated probability of f of 1-1, f of 1-1, one, one, f of 2-2, two, two, f of 3-3, three, three, etc. And likewise, we saw that example of having a 2 and then a 3. We said getting a 2 and then a 3, the probability of that was 2 out of 36. And I looked at this f of 3, 1. We showed that that was impossible. So you can see all of the, the probabilities. Basically, if they match, it's going to be 1 out of 36. If the smaller, if the first number is smaller, right, we'll have 2 out of 36. And otherwise, it's simply going to be an impossible event. And I believe I have that summarized here. So I do have a nice probability density function. And it says exactly what I just said. It says if x and y are equal, but again, they're bounded above by 6 and below by 1. If they're the same, that happens with a probability of 1 out of 36. It says if x is less than y, again, bounded by 1 and 6, that's 2 out of 36. And it's going to be 0 otherwise. And notice we could have even specified it's going to be 0 otherwise. This is if... Um, x isn't greater than y, right? We, we can't happen. That can't happen. That first value reported cannot be larger than the second value, just the way we set it up. Okay, so this example to me, you know, this is kind of one of those dice example you see. I've got one more. This one feels a little better to me. and Maybe it will you as well, or maybe you felt fine with the other. But here we go. One more example of these joint uh, density functions. Okay, so we've got a group of nine coworkers. So here's our nine coworkers over here. And four of those people have a PhD. Three of those people have at most a master's degree. And two of those people have at most an undergraduate degree. Now, suppose three of those people are going to get promoted, and we're going to let X denote the number of people selected with a PhD, and we're going to let Y denote the number of people with a at most a master's. And we're assuming that three are chosen at random. We want to know what's the joint PDF. Okay, so let's find, let's compute some values. So maybe I wanted to compute this f of two zero. What, what, are, we, what are we finding here? Well, it says that we're selecting a two people with a PhD, right? So we want to select two people with a PhD but we want to select zero, zero with a master's degree. Now let's think here, because it doesn't really say this, but what else is happening? And this is something we have to be aware of, right, when we do probability, compute probabilities. So if we got two with a PhD and zero with a master's, what else happened? Well, we got one with an undergraduate, undergraduate degree. Right, that would be our, our situation in this case. Well, we can now compute these probabilities using combinations and the multiplication principle. I'll go through this a little bit faster because I assume that you are familiar with this. Okay, so the total number of possibilities, right? I've got nine people to pick from total, and I'm going to choose three of those for a promotion. So that's the total number of possibilities. In the numerator, we'll have to address our specific situation using the multiplication principle. Well, it says, okay, I've got a total of, what do we have? We had four people with a PhD, and we said we're going to choose two of those. 
we said we've got three people with a master's degree. We're going to choose zero of those. And again, be careful because if you stop here, there's going to be problems. We also have to multiply by this extra factor, right? We've got uh, two people with an undergraduate degree, and we must be choosing one of those to make this situation work out. So this is going to be equal to 12 out of 84. When I say make this situation work out, I mean choosing three people, right? That's what we have to do. So that would be the probability of selecting two with a PhD and zero with a master's. Let's look at this next, of you know, computing f of 0, 0. How can that happen? You know, what's the probability of that? So this says we, have, we select 0 with a PhD. We select 0 with a PhD. We also select 0 with a master's degree. Well, if that happens, what must be happening? That means that uh, we must be picking 3 with an undergraduate degree, right? It means that... All of our people that we're choosing have undergraduate degrees, but notice we can't promote three people that only have an undergraduate degree because I've only got two people. Well, so the probability of this event happening, that must be zero. Let's compute one last one because, hey, this is fun. So this says we're going to get two with a PhD, one with a master's, and again, by default, one with an undergrad. So we can compute this one. Let me give myself a little more space here. Let's see here. The denominator is still the same. We've got nine. We're going to choose three of those. So in the numerator, it says we've got four people with a PhD. We're going to choose two of those people. We've got, what do we say? We've got, we're going to choose out of those three with a master's, we're going to choose one of those. And, oh, sorry, I've got this. Yeah, okay, that, look, that looks good. And then by default, um, our two people that only have an undergraduate, we must be choosing zero of those people. And what did I get this value to be? I think I summarized it in my table below. So let's look at our joint probability density function here. And I didn't come up with a nice closed formula, but maybe we can make sense out of this. So it looks like I did compute this. So this says if we select two people with a PhD and just one person with a master's, it says the probability of that happening, I already computed these, it looks like this was equal to, this was equal to 18 out of 24. And you can read off the other probabilities that I have computed as well. So we saw the probability of getting zero PhD people and zero people with a master's is zero because again, um, it simply can't happen. Likewise, we've got some other zeros. Maybe I look at this zero here. You know, I look at this zero, right? That says what must have happened. That says we selected two people with a PhD for promotion and two people with a master's degree for promotion. Well, again, that can't happen, right? Because now we've promoted four people. So that doesn't work. And you can read off the rest of the table. And that would now be my joint probability density function. So notice I don't have a nice closed formula for it. That's okay. It still, it still works. So okay, so this is just a quick uh, introduction to joint probability density functions. As you know, as often as the case, computing these probabilities can kind of be the, the tricky part. But, of course, there's different techniques, and it just depends on the situation. So hopefully this video makes some sense, and the next one to go with this one, I'll start talking about uh, uh, marginal marginals um, that go with these. And we'll talk about what that means, and we'll look at it in regards, I think, to this, uh, this last example.